Also, it was uh, another matter that is of some relevance is that uh, the uh, system was more and more complex and it did not lose complexity because of the war but even before the war it became very complex and the speed at which it moved it increased increased because of the invention sure. of all sorts of telegraphs and <laughs> telephones which were immediately used right. because like now like you know when you lay in live fiber cable H in high one, frequency trading uh, yeah. everything they get the stuff as soon as it is invented right because they are the people who can pay more right and it's the the thing that yields most i'm shocked yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it is so yes, yes. so when uh, you were saying before what happens with the war yeah well what happens with the war is uh, basically that uh, the war is fought physically in some countries and it plays havoc with the regions where it is fought. It is, however, the last war that is fought in a place. In the Second World War, because of aviation and the change in um, also transportation capacity, uh, you know, motorized uh, uh, armies and so on, it's all over the place. But First World War is still a place where you go to fight the war in a place. For instance, the Alps here, the Somme uh, in uh, in uh, the, the plains in France. Uh, so you assemble enormous amounts of people there, and they kill one another, then the war is over and they go home. That is how it used to be. And that was the last one fought that way, with firepower that had increased thousands of times. So the numbers then, as you know, are yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. So, however, it is a war that is uh, unlike other wars in being uh, a war of people. It is a total war, mobilizes everybody, and for our, for our, for our own purposes it has giant armies that, has, uh, that are, uh, how do you say, uh, volunteer at the beginning, but then they are Quickly conscript. conscript. Uh, yeah. And that means that there are millions of people taken away from agriculture and from industry, women in industry, women in agriculture replace them up to a point and then they are mobilized in the front. They go physically away, they get killed but you know a fraction, then they come home and you have a problem with what to do with them after the First World War. But then the problem is that the places where war is fought uh, and even the whole countries are mobilized in order to produce to items to be destroyed you say but in consumption we do that all the time yes but we keep alive that mm. was saying to kill people of course if you eat some stuff you also die <laughs> but that is something completely different as it's you a know long and it's short a job problem <laughs> yeah. Uh, then uh, the thing is uh, that countries that were self-sufficient in agriculture and in other supplies, because, they, because of the war effort, have to buy from abroad. They develop balance of payments, uh, deficits, and public finance deficits to fight the war. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is uh, to make a difference uh, between wars that are fought with debt, <coughs> which is uh, the wars of Britain, the wars of Italy, wars of France, and when it came to war, the United States, and uh, the war of the, uh, of the Prussians the German Empire. German Empire was a federal empire and the long and short of it is that the federal power to get into that was extremely limited. So that is one of the ways to explain why the German war was fought by printing money. <laughs>
because uh, money supply was in the hands of the empire, not of the single states. Or the fiscal power was mm -hmm. in the hands of the state to a point that no, people the point usually is very important. Uh, ignore because it is an internal problem of Germany. But it is also relevant because of the way the wars are fought. Yeah. Now, we can get into that. We can also, and they cannot, get the money we don't have from the British and from the Americans, the French, the Italians, and the other allies, as it were. And the British can get into debt with the Americans, and Americans give uh, credit to everybody, but not to the Germans. Right. Because the Germans are, uh, they never did, even when they were neutral. There were some small credits. I actually was sitting see, in the public see, records see, office, see. and somebody sent me the wrong file, and it was a file full of things from Kunin Loeb mm. loans to German cities before we entered, the United States entered World War One, i I'm sure that is the case. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you compare the size to the total, it is sure, an interesting very thing small. for an economic very historian small. to write an article on. Yeah. But uh, very small from the point of view yeah. of the totals. Yeah. The totals is that uh, the Germans could not borrow uh, from abroad or internally. Yeah. And then they resorted to many creations. So there was inflation. That explains inflation as a war finance system in Germany. Not elsewhere. Elsewhere it was a process that uh, happened, as it were. There it was the way in which the German was, war was financed. So that makes for the uh, difference in homogeneity. There is no homogeneity between losers and, as it were, winners. The winners were the ones that had to deal with the debt. And of course, the Germans <laughs> did not have the debt. But then the French said, ah, le Bosch paiera. And so they said, we have the debt, but they we're going to transfer it because they lost. Yeah. Hmm? In effect, the proposal is, let's, let's make the Germans pay, pay for, the for our costs. Yeah. Exactly. Which leads to? Well, it leads to everything else. Yes. Because everybody then inflates the the, the, how do you say, the claims. The British uh, start by saying, ah, a terrible thing, we can't do that, and then they put up the, the largest claims yeah. against Germany. Once you play that game, we play it. Yes, and the Americans were sitting there holding credits that they, I mean, they, they were owed money. They were owed money by everybody. The British were owed money by Italians and French. Yeah. And then there was something in particularly interesting, which is when the British say, look, uh, since we're, going to, we're having this war, and since uh, gold has to be uh, shifted uh, between countries, which is difficult because the u boat are all over the place, yeah, right. then why don't we concentrate all the, in the Bank of England? <laughs> and they no. did. No. <laughs> the Italians, after the First World War, had the greatest... Uh, difficulties in getting it back. Because British said, what's wrong with it? We keep it there. It's yours, but it's much more efficient. Yeah. The Italians are neo-nationalists, you know, the war is over. We want it back. You know, of course, who's just done it again? The Germans. Germans have taken the gold from the Fed and oh, yes. brought it back to Berlin. Yes, this point. Just in case. Yes, just this. <laughs> well, you know. Well, because in Berlin, the, the Bundes, and Bundes uh, uh, not Rat, the other one, the Bundes... Central Bank? Stag. No. Uh, the Bundestag. Questions that started being asked. Are you sure it is 35, as it were, billions? Did you count it? Yeah. Did you ask, yeah. say it? We have that Are in the United States, the usually on the far right. <laughs> What's really in Fortnite? Si, si, si. um, but the Germans yeah. were saying, who tells you? Have you counted it? So they had to send a, a delegation, very yeah. embarrassed central bankers, saying, excuse us, but these strange right. people want us to count <laughs> what we have here. How many, how many oh, <laughs> bullion are there? <laughs> and it's happened now. No, so I, you can I, imagine well 1914, aware, yes. 1920. Sure. Things um, have a way of coming back, which frightens me enormously. Uh, That's one of them. First time is tragedy, second time is farce. They yeah, don't tell you what happens on the third, the third time. time. Yeah, right. <laughs>
Um, but let's, I mean, so just to sort of lay out the picture, we have this chain of war debts. Mm. It's worth noticing that the American private banks had lent large sums to the British, and at the end of the war, the Wilson administration most obligingly paid off the private bank claims and took on the debts to itself. So they all became basically intergovernmental debts um, there. Uh, yeah, because the agent for the British government had been uh, the Morgan, Morgan Bank. J.P. Morgan yeah. and Company. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Well, um, okay, so, uh, and in the process, the British had liquidated a vast amount of their overseas investments, which I'm sure is a point. And the U.S. had gone from being a uh, net debtor to a net creditor on a colossal scale. That's a, the new thing. Yes, yes. That's we the new it, thing. Just and also the fact that uh, the Americans had got used to being suppliers of agricultural raw materials to countries which normally did not need it. Yeah. And they had developed agriculture accordingly. And also they had supplied finished goods, you know, nope. high technology goods. Sure. So they were used now to having this export surplus and yeah. they feared like hell to have uh, to go back to a time when there would not be a need for such uh, supplies any longer because the break up of uh, the break uh, out of peace that is what it meant that yeah. bit by bit the agricultures in Europe went back to normal and so they did not need these imports right. no, and it's been it. gigantic you know for the this so called farm problem in the united states yeah, then that is uh, mushrooms yes what originated it but uh, it was huge because for instance the italians imported enormous quantities of wheat, grains, and wheat in particular. So much so that uh, Keynes remarked, who by the time was working at the Treasury, it can't be true, it can't be that the Italians eat so much <laughs> bread. Uh, it was true, the Italians ate just bread. No. They didn't have any meat. No. And that was much better than before the war, for <laughs> the soldiers were eating nothing at home, as it were. At right. least they were fed in the in the army for the first time in their lives. Mm. But it was true. So this shows that uh, some uh, even conceptual things are difficult to conceptualize by clever people like Gaines because of uh, his own uh, his own habits. Say, what can he do with all this bread? <laughs> but it was true. It did mean that we had to Im keep importing for a while. Also, because people got used to eating more rather mm. than less. Of course, it is one way. You do internal devaluation, that is deflation, and then people start learning to eat less again. But that's somehow, if you have a democracy, it's a clashes, political problem. Uh, with with yeah. the permanence of democracy, which is uh, one of the things a that major happened major issue Italy. in the interwar period. Yeah, yeah. so the, uh, then uh, with this world which is now, seeing the Americans being the first nation and the first creditor, the British having depleted their, uh, say, assets in the United States. Yeah. And what yeah. I can add, because I always had in deference to understand what Britain was at the time, it was voluntary. They gave them up. I can imagine what would have happened in Italy. Say, so please give us uh, your American investments and we'll give you... Well, they were being compensated. I mean... Yeah, but you know, but you have to believe in your government. Um, that the British consul is going to be yes. the best in the world. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> How many other countries well, that, that, could right, do that's, that? This is a post-war adjustment problem in which going back to the gold standard might look pretty attractive to people who are holding large debts like that. For instance. Yes. For instance. And yeah. that was very important because, as I'm very fond of saying, uh, well, I'm not the only one, really, not the first one, but it is important, the British debt, national debt, was considered by Britain part of the armaments of the country. 
a defense, say, right. uh, industry. <laughs> right. And it was called, uh, it was immediately understood by people like Immanuel Kant. Right. Immanuel Kant said that this is a way in which the British can fight war without end, because they have the money of the whole world to fight it. No. Not that they have a, uh, the, 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 the term in, uh, in Germany where they kept it and when it goes down you make peace. That's right. No, there it keeps flowing in because of the national great invention. And uh, Kant thought it was as deadly as any armament. And he the so army. did a lot of other people by the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Ah, yeah. But it did work yeah. for them, and yeah. it kept working for them. And it is a reason why the British currency was always, the attempt was always to keep it up. Yeah. Because if you had all these creditors all over the world and in your country, and then the voice of the creditors was an important one. And if you made wars with this system, then it was a strategic primary importance. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons that helps us to understand the reversion to the gold standard at that rate. Yeah, so we should probably sketch this picture just a touch. Yeah. I mean, the British want to go back to gold at the old parity mm. in the end. Mm. Um, the Americans have tons of gold. Mm. Uh, and don't particularly have a problem. Uh, but nearly everybody else in Europe has left the gold standard, has to pick a rate at which it wants to go on, uh, and in many cases has severe problems. So now how would you sort of then describe what then happens in this process? I mean, there's effectively a British design for this system, an American design for this system. The Americans stayed out of the League of Nations, um, leaving them formally with no clear voice in international councils. Now, they developed a way around that, that so-called unofficial diplomacy, where Owen Young, the chair of General Electric, or J.P. Morgan, uh, Jr., uh, or Thomas Lamont would go to the White House, be photographed with the president coming out, and it, uh, the Europeans would understand that these are the people who's ta who are talking for the American government, but the American government isn't formally in that system. Um, but so, can you, I mean, you've written a lot about the um, interwar uh, banking and adjustment. Let's talk about it. Well, this is uh, an interesting topic because of several reasons. And uh, as you just said, there was a, a diversity of aims and uh, actual positions on the part of the British and the Americans. And the rest of the countries in Europe having variegated uh, versions of the British version, with the defeated countries uh, being treated not at all the same way, yeah. because the Austro, the, you know, the Austro-Hungarian Empire broke up. In, it broke up, and the successor countries, nations, uh, were uh, treated uh, one way, and the Germans remained united, and they lost uh, perhaps territory, but they remained one country, and they did get another treatment. But why don't we talk the about the problem British. at the beginning? Is, it... is that British want to keep, as what I said before, running the international financial and monetary system, and they know that they cannot do it because they become a debtor country. They had divested themselves of all their uh, of all their assets in the United States. They don't have that any longer to to you know to pay to get money, and also the surplus of pre-war surplus of British India is dwindled. It's not there really seriously any longer. So these two factors have become different. The amount of gold they have uh, 
the Bank of England is tiny, but they are interested in having the whole of Europe reconstruct their currencies or construct their currencies if they are successor states in a way that will permit a freedom of capital movement such that they will uh, be going through London freely as they used to. But in order to reconstruct these currencies in Europe, which have all gone to paper during the war, they've been only in convertible, how do you send them back to convertibility at an acceptable rate for the British, which means without too much devaluation, then you have to lend to these governments or the central banks in order for them to re-establish convertibility. The British invent the system. convertibility into gold. Yeah. Yes, into gold. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the British invent the system, which uh, is a merry-go-round in the sense that suppose we have uh, 20, 100 in gold. Then we make a list of countries that have to go back. And first of all, yeah. let's say, is uh, Germany. Then we'll enter Germany. Then that gold will be returned and lent to the second in the rung. And then bit by bit, everybody goes back with one, with one unit gold of gold. There. And the Americans don't like that. Because it is an elegant way of saying, you have all the gold, but look, we have invented a system which doesn't need your gold. And so, having uh, knowing that gold, you can eat it, but it is not very good, then, uh, you know, you have got that gold, but uh, we have uh, changed the game, <laughs> as it were. And they tend to undo these uh, doings of the British, and in particular, of the architect of it all, which is who is Montague Norman, who's become a mythical figure. Yeah, in the governor of the bank. The governor England. of the Bank of England. No. And the scion of one of the prime uh, uh, banking, merchant banking families of, uh, of um, London. By the way, a family that has uh, great banking interest, financial interests in the United States as well. They, they they know the United States as their own territory. So uh, Montague Norman, who is a domineering figure in this whole story, and who is uh, really uh, um, staying there as head of the of the central bank for decades, literally, and who presided over the uh, new building in Threadneedle Street, which was supposed to be resistant to a charge of I don't know how many millions of tons of <laughs> of ballistite, of, of uh, explosive from the air. It was, um, it was like a bunker. Anyway, a man of a certain strangeness, let us say, but also quite capable. And as he claimed in the end, always following the instructions from the government. He was loyal to his own government. He tried to make it uh, think like him, but he, when he said, the Treasury said something, he did it. And it is true, it's been ascertained. So it shows that the British, uh, say, elites were in this united. So they tried to do it, in spite of uh, the fact that they owed all of them a lot of money to the Americans. And it depended on the Americans to make uh, a deal with them to settle yeah. the... There are the incentives it's probably worth mentioning, include small details like the Bolshevik Revolution and the threat of disorder in Central Europe did concentrate the minds, if not of everybody in the United States of a fair number of 
uh, American senior diplomats and business figures. Yes, that was one of the undoing of poor old uh, uh, Britain, because in spite of the mutiny of the Navy. That's 1931, right? Which is yeah. a bit later on. Yeah. The country was never supposed to be on the verge of going communist. Right. Joining the Bolshevs. Yeah, right. Never, never. In fact, even now, when a child is being passed, they say, don't be so Bolshevik, which means yeah, don't play right. like a Bolshevik. That's a one well-known <laughs> English as a intercalation. Yeah. And so it shows the country was never on the verge. It was not a threat. Yeah. Nobody, no British would say, would go to Washington and say, look, there is a Bolshevik threat in England. Well, no, there were several elections it. in the 20s that people tried to make the claim, but that was roughly like weapons of mass destruction yeah, in I, Iraq. Yeah, it, yeah, I, I he take called it, the British I, Labour Party. Yeah, <laughs> I, you must I be understand. joking. As I understand, way. but... Uh, they themselves yes. pretended. Yes. Even after the Second World War, they pretended all the time but, that uh, they were on the verge but, of going coming, but... In other countries, it was uh, much yeah. more, uh, say, credible. As yeah, so a threat. let's let's how it get if we can sort of focus on here. So, how does Norman's strategy play out? Well, the Norman strategy plays out uh, in a way that, uh, unfortunately, should include the Prince of uh, Denmark, but it doesn't. That is to say, Germany's uh, debts are settled uh, before everybody else. In twenty-four, it's all done. Yeah, it's in the uh, Dawes plan, you mean. Uh, and so... Right, and a postponement. I mean, every everybody got stretch outs. I mean, the British and the French signed debt accords with the U.S. that effectively gave them uh, big Yeah, but breaks. the, the but, uh, settlement, uh, um, debt settlement uh, agreements, for instance, of the British, is not a particularly pleasant one for them. Oh, agreed. Yeah. Because of that, because they are not perceived as a threat. These right. people are with us anyway. Yeah. And then uh, the French are much subtler. The Italians, bah, I think they got uh, what they, they would get anyway. But uh, the Americans have, uh, of this debt settlement policy, a weapon to intervene in yeah. this scheme yeah, and here break it. It might be worth observing that you were the historian responsible for doing much of the work on the history of the Italian Central Bank in this period and have seen a vast number of archives Oh yeah. uh, in this point. For that reason. Yeah. And it is from the consultation of these papers, which I in part reproduced in these huge volumes well, on the interwar period. Alas, in Italian. In I Italian. Mean, but no, but the documents are often in I other countries. Oh, I know. In other I have a copy. Languages. Yeah. Then uh, the uh, <coughs> what comes out is exactly this enmity between the plan of the British and the plan of the Americans, which are, as we said before, one to maximize the use of gold, right. and then one to minimize the use of gold. Right. In old yeah. pre-war terms, yep. it could be said like that. And uh, an episode which is not particularly well known therefore worth mentioning, is the fight for South Africa. South Africa produces gold and produces 20% yeah, of the of gold. It. So the British, having had a war with the Boers, tried to influence them working <laughs> through the head of the Netherlandish Bank, the Bank of, uh, of Holland, as you know, of the Low Countries, and they send a mission, and the mission is formed by this uh, gentleman and by the Americans. It's Vissering, right? Uh, Vissering, yeah. Gerard Vissering, and the American Dr. Money. Cameron? Yes. Yeah. Professor Cameron. Edwin. W. Edwin Cameron, representing the United States and being a um, prophet of gold usage. But, unfortunately, Gerard Wissering gets ill, and so it is up to 
<laughs> Mr. Cameron to convince the South Africans who were already convinced to go back to gold and not to the gold exchange standard. That is to say, gold directly, he said, you own it all. Rather than sending it as they had done all the time to London, depositing it there, thus for a while increasing the reserves yeah. of the Bank of England. They don't do it anymore. They come back to gold. They stop this flow. And they don't come back to the newfangled version of the gold standard, which the British have invented, the gold exchange standard, which was there before the First World War. Yeah. Only we have already spoken of its uh, say gradual demise because of the war threat before the uh, 10 years before the, uh, the First World War. Then there is an attempt to resuscitate it in a much, much, on a much larger scale and on a formal scale by Britain, saying that uh, countries, the world in Europe can be divided into uh, center countries and peripheral countries in order to draw in the, the French, as usual. So France can have uh, countries reserve, have their reserves in French francs, in France, therefore not using gold. And the British could have, of course, the reserves of other countries uh, who would then use the pound and not gold. And South Africa was supposed to do that. But then South Africa, for the reasons I've said, uh, doesn't do it. No. Germany doesn't do it. Yeah, how do you character? Yeah, how would you characterize the British relationship with the Germans, the Dawes plan, the Americans, and also I think we ought to say something about the League of Nations efforts in the East. Exactly. You know, the League of Nations is interesting because it's much more there. The economic section. And the rest of Europe says it's a British section run by the British, and it is true. Well, but they are not influential seriously in Germany. In Germany is a no. is a how is it, personal relationship, nation to nation relationship, and the United States there are much more important. Yeah. And in fact, with the help of the Germans themselves, who don't want at all to have the gold exchange standard. Well, after the, the reconstruction shocked, you know, the reconstruction from the great inflation and the destruction of the old rice mark, then the plan to save the rice mark is brought to fruition by Dr. Schacht. And Dr. Schacht wants to have a currency as before the war, full-fledged currency. Of course, the uh, allies are important. It's still a country that is not sovereign. Mm. But the Americans have their way. And, you know, French and Italians, not, nobody wanted the gold exchange standard except the British. And so the British lost. And that is visible in the one case in which they did not lose, which is the reconstruction of Eastern currencies after the, in the Balkans, as it were, mm. after the demise of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Because there, the League of Nations, run by the British, has much greater say, for instance, Bank of Hungary, which is, uh, uh, how do you say, the reconstruction from the uh, Florent uh, Devai, um, inflation, is, uh, uh, really run by uh, British Treasury people. And the same applies to other currencies, even the Austrian crown. Could, could I raise this a point you make, which I constantly point to people as I think really a, an extremely acute observation, is the way the lack of military alliances after World War I complicated all of the international uh, economic discussions. And they're just not allies in ah. particular. And the, the contrast with the end of World War II, 
is is pretty obvious. Of course, and yeah. it rate, but it does lead one to consider things like well, uh, not just about the euro where you have military alliances mostly, uh, but in Asia where you have military alliances. But the wrong, I mean, but con <laughs> <They're> contrasting <laughs> <laughs> there, but. I mean, maybe you could talk a bit about, so by the late 20s, when you know, American capital is flowing back into Germany, uh, and you know, the Germans are erecting this small but real social welfare state getting mm. rolling, and, and, and the right in Germany is uh, largely unreconciled to the Weimar Republic, mm. and that uh, so we're talk. Maybe you could talk a bit about the British and French relations. Uh, there, what's what's relations like between the Bank of France and the Bank of England? Uh, and that's interesting because um, the French discovered the United States, as it were. So they have uh, closer relations than they ever had with the uh, Americans, yeah. and they also tend not to do things the way that poor old Norman wanted and would have uh, liked. Because when they stabilize, they stabilize at a rate which is not... Uh, it's a good deal lower than, exactly. the, yeah, than the than the pre-war rate. Exactly. Yeah, what do you make of all that? I mean, in the, exactly who's doing what to whom inside and outside of France? Uh, well, that is not so easy, you know, no. because I think that uh, uh, the uh, uh, story we have told before of protecting the the rentier wouldn't be there. But then, well, with with the moment, except however, the Poincare, uh, well, uh, there is a that we this is not a South American republic. Yeah. And they're not exporting all that much. Right. Therefore, all that story about the export industries is yeah. not there. That's a story that's in Kindleberger, though, when the actual, there is, in a, I think, in a footnote, he claims some of the exporting industry representatives. I am sure, yes. Yeah. The exporting yeah. industries but I don't believe uh, plead it. for, yeah. uh, they always do. Yeah. You yeah. Know, right. In every country, yeah. you will see that they do. Yeah. However, the, the main thing is that the important thing is to, uh, link, see the link between the external value of the franc and the internal value of the franc. And the British, the French Rantier is interested in the internal value of the franc. Uh, he is not, this is not a country of gigantic capital outflows. People do go to Switzerland, but not the same way as they do in Italy, for instance. Uh, recently. At the time, therefore, stabilization, internal stabilization, a stable stabilization would be more important. But also, if you stabilize low, then you have a tendency to go up. Mm. And therefore, money from outside comes in. Say, the franc is going to revalue because they stabilized so low. Therefore, let's go there and wait for the yeah. franc to go up. And that's my reading of what's in the Banque de France archives. I mean, it's basically a story about maybe we could become a financial center too. Again, yeah. that is yeah. the yeah. eternal story. Yeah. Even today they're talking about that because it's always been why they and not us across the channel, three minutes yeah. away right. from us. And uh, we are always on the verge of and we never managed to. And that time, since the British are in dire straits, having lost all their investments, then the French think that they have a chance. Also, the so-called uh, gold exchange standard, uh, for them, if it works for anything, it works for that, to make a financial center of Paris, which is Paris, which is always on the verge of becoming one. It's almost one. It's not like saying, you know, uh, Rome is a financial center. The people start laughing the minute you say yeah. it. Paris has been a financial center, yeah. an international one, so it is credible. So at the time, being England much uh, diminished, 
they find it with the help or with a community of uh, reasons, of intents with the Americans, they can uh, have uh, their way. And definitely it is true that if you stabilize too low, low enough, then people will immediately say this is too low and pour money into the franc. Now that's the new thing we have to discuss, because before the war there had been short-term capital movements. But now they become yeah. much more serious because political uncertainty, which was there but not seriously before the First World War, becomes a serious matter. Also because of what you said, the existence at a certain point of Europe of a new regime which says that the others are illegitimate and it frightens the Americans for their own people because these are times that are extremely tough on the American workers one has to remember the 1920s yeah, no, it's with a famous question who benefited from the prosperity of the 20s well, the, Pascal, the be is a best answer is armies, not workers the yeah. famous private armies well, there were all, I mean, just about every large industrial firm exactly. had the Black Legion, huh. uh, was General Motors, most American railroads had but big it was, uh, you know, it was uh, a reasonable thing to consider. Yeah. Because, you know, Ayman Minsky, whom we all knew, once came to Italy, came to Italy frequently, and told me, look, to understand the way the United States has changed, you must remember that my father and mother met in New York at an enormous dance to celebrate Karl Marx's birthday. So That's, that uh, was New yeah, York. That was a long time ago. Yeah, yes. but I know this is I, I when we are talking. I understand. No, no. But I, the Americans really thought that they had revolution on their doorstep. So it was, the word was, uh, in Italy you had the first semi-revolution and then fascism. Right. And the world was changing very fast. Yeah. So international capital movements, which is what we are interested in, yep. um, were maximized. Yeah. Long term and short term. Yeah. Long term later on because of the money of the Jews being, you know, the Jews being delegitimized everywhere, having to escape and took their money with them, but also other rich people uh, putting money long term. It's essentially flight capital. Flight capital, but long term. Right. And we're talking about in moving capital between centers, money centers of Europe. Yeah. One day here, one day there, one day in another place, and inventing all sorts of uh, transactions that have stayed with us. Yeah. 